So uh, thank you for joining this uh, seminar. So um, my name is Isnaini from in Lipi, Indonesia. So uh, today is a webinar lesser series number two about terahertz characterization of nanomaterial for energy devices. So actually this is a webinar, uh, a joint webinar between LIPI and uh, ILE, Osaka, Japan, uh, as a starting, uh, starting step after our MOU. So our rundown uh, of the program is just, uh, there's uh, some welcoming speech and also uh, after that, we have uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Muhandis Siddiq and Dr. Falin Katrin. And, uh, and after that, we have a short discussion. So uh, first, I would like to greet uh, our special guest. Uh, welcome Dr. Agus Haryono, uh, Deputy for Engineering Sciences, LIPI, also Professor uh, Ryosuke Kodama, Director of Institute of Laser uh, Engineering, Osaka University, Japan, and also uh, Dr. Rika Yudianti, the Head of Research Center for Physics, uh, Professor Nikijima Makoto, thank you for uh, attending this uh, seminar. Uh, two speakers, Dr. Mohandis and Dr. Falin Katrin, uh, our audience, our beloved audience, thank you for joining uh, this uh, seminar. So we have a short uh, announcement. So because we use a Zoom meeting, so uh, I think the host will going to uh, unmute your uh, uh, microphone. But if not, please uh, uh, unmute your mute mute your microphone during the seminar, so the seminar can uh, go very well. So there will be attending list for those who need a e-certificate. You can, we will send you the set, uh, the link for attending list. And also there will be, I think for Indonesian only participant, there will be a door price. Uh, yeah, because the door price is the pawn credit, not much, but just just enough for fun, yeah, for the, for the audience. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give this opportunity to uh, Dr. Agus Haryono, Deputy for Engineering Sciences, Indonesia Institute of Science, to give an opening remark uh, for Dr. Agus Haryono. Uh, time is yours. Thank you, uh, Isnaini. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank to each and every one of you for being here today at this important webinar on tetrahertz characterization on nanomaterial for energy devices. My name is Agus Haryono, Deputy Chairman for Engineering Sciences, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI. <clears throat> it is such a great honor for me to speak on behalf of Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI, on this uh, very important seminar. Let me begin you a warm welcome to this webinar. And before we get started, I'd like to express my appreciation to Professor Yusuke Kodama, Dr. Rika Yudianti, Dr. Falin Katrin, and Dr. Mohandi Siddiq, the speaker of this uh, webinar. We couldn't have done this uh, very wonderful webinar without the, the cooperation from all of you here. In today's webinar, we are going to explore the collaboration as mentioned by Pa Isnain before, the collaboration between LIPI and ILE, Osaka, Japan. On the other hand, I hope that this webinar will help us to overcome many problems in developing uh, energy devices using the facilities in ILE, Osaka, Japan. 
I think the participant for this webinar is not only come from NIPI, but also come from many universities that also want to know the, the explanation and uh, what is the uh, characterization using the IRE in Osaka, Japan. And this webinar is like the beginning of our uh, collaboration yeah, between LIPI and ILE. And I hope uh, not only stop in this webinar, but the collaboration will continue by some uh, joint research, joint uh, preparation for proposal research internationally, and also exchange of uh, scientists and researcher from LIPI to ILE, and also from ILE to LIPI, because next year we would like we would like to inform you that uh, LIPI will provide the opportunity to receive postdoc for uh, for certain months until one year. And I hope uh, some of researcher from ILE Osaka Japan can also use this uh, opportunity to exchange the scientists put from Japan to Indonesia and from Indonesia to Japan. And contact point for this uh, collaboration is the Center for Physics. Uh, here, Dr. Rike Yudianti attending with us today. And I hope uh, many researchers, not only from Research Center for Physics, but also another research center that using nanomaterials that uh, maybe use the laser, tetra laser for the characterization will can join this collaboration, not only the center of physics. And I would like also to invite many experts from uh, ILE Osaka Japan to come to LIPI in uh, joining uh, the preparation of our uh, research infrastructure because in 2022 uh, we are going to establish new uh, research infrastructure on advanced materials and maybe Burika from uh, director for research center for physics later on can discuss with professor Kodama in detail what kind of uh, advanced material research infrastructure that will be established in Serpong in Indonesia in 2022 and before that we we have to uh, prepare and collect many information to uh, establish that uh, research infrastructure i hope this collaboration can uh, provide many advantages can be obtained from both partners from uh, for indonesia and also for japan and also can uh, exchange the expert and well, I don't want to take too much of your time. I need to hand over it to Master of Ceremony. And last but not least, I'd like to say once more, on behalf of uh, BP, I'd like to welcome you and please enjoy this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agus Haryono, for the opening remark. So now I'll give a time to Professor Rezuke Kodama to give a speech or a preface uh, regarding this web, uh, web seminar, or maybe the collaboration between LIPI and ILE. To uh, Professor Kodama, time is yours. OK, thank you. And uh, can I share my PowerPoint? Oh, yes, sure. I think you can do it now. Is it, is it okay? If not, I will make you the co-host. Not yet. Not no. yet. Hmm. Uh, will then bisa dibuat co-host? Yeah, okay. you can do it. Now. Yeah. 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 Can I see uh, my PowerPoint? Yeah, it is. It okay. is so now. Okay. You okay. can continue. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you at August 
Hari Ono and Rike, uh, Riki, Rike Yudainti. Sorry, uh, my pronunciation yeah. is not so good. And uh, anyway, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, uh, I would like to appreciate all the staff for uh, the arrangement of uh, uh, this Zoom meeting for our joint research between RIP, uh, LIPI and uh, Hairi Osaka. Okay. It is my pleasure to have this opportunity and uh, speech as a preface of this meeting. Okay, okay. so, uh, okay, so, okay. Okay, so first I will a little bit introduce Osaka. So Osaka University is at, uh, located in the north uh, of north uh, uh, north of the Osaka prefecture. This is Osaka North prefecture, and uh, Osaka is located in the west side of Japan. And uh, and uh, Osaka is a very progressive city and uh, one of the most historical city in Japan from whole century to the present. Okay, so uh, when you come to Osaka, you can visit one of the Japanese at the World Heritage uh, site where you can find that the largest uh, ancient tomb in Japan uh, built in uh, the uh, whole century. And you can see uh, the uh, sword uh, smith and the uh, castle. In this century, you can, uh, now that, uh, in this century, you can also uh, visit uh, the universe, Universal Studio in Osaka, okay? And, uh, in the history of Osaka, one of the roots of our university, okay, yeah, uh, which is at the Kaitokudo, and uh, which is a school established by the town's people of uh, Osaka, uh, 1724. And uh, uh, another uh, root of the university is the Tekijuku, okay, which is a private school of the Western study, uh, uh, established at uh, 1838, about uh, 200 years ago. Then our university was established as uh, one of the imperial universities in Japan about 100 years ago. Okay. And uh, in this university, our institute, IRE, uh, started about 50 years ago. And uh, and this is a brief history of IRE Osaka. And uh, first, that, uh, uh, IRE started as a uh, laser facility, laser engineering facility in Graduate School of Engineering, Osaka University. And uh, IRE started, Institute of Laser Engineering was started as a center of laser fusion research in uh, 1976. Okay. And, uh, and then that in 2000, 2004, IRE was authorized as a user's facility for the community of plasma science and uh, for interdis interdisciplinary research, research such as laser astrophysics. And uh, two, uh, 2017, IRE was uh, uh, positioned up as uh, one of the uh, six research institutes in Osaka University for community of laser science as well as plasma science. And uh, in the, uh, our institute we will celebrate it, its 50th anniversary in 2022, okay? And, uh, okay. And uh, uh, the number of the IRE, uh, the number of IRE member is about now that uh, 250 consisted of uh, 80 scientists and about 100 students, okay? And uh, uh, in our institute uh, consists of the whole core uh, research division. One is at the uh, division for photon and the quantum beam science, uh, covers at the optical science, laser engineering, terahertz photonics, power photonics, plasma photonics, and nuclear photonics, okay? And uh, this division contributed to that the creation of the new innovations by promoting that the uh, industry university partnership and interdisciplinary collaboration with uh, the other core divisions. And the second one is that the division for high energy science, uh, 
uh, the laser astrophysics, high pressure material science, and the physics of ultra high field. And the third one is division for laser fusion science. And the fourth one is the division for theoretical and computational science. Okay. And today you have a meeting with one of the Terra Health group, which is at, uh, uh, conducted by Professor uh, Nakajima in such a research division. Okay. More detail will follow later in this session, I think. So I skipped this one. Okay. And our institute is at the Center for Excellence of Laser Science and uh, High Energy Science in Japan. And, uh, carrying out uh, more than 100 jo joint research per uh, year in the next joint re research project. We have a large laser facility, Gekko 12 and other, other, another one, located in Osaka campus, okay, here, oh, Osaka. And, uh, and we have a large laser facility, Gekko 12, okay. And this is a, a most energetic, uh, uh, laser system in Japan. And we have also that the hyper laser facility in, uh, in Japanese XFER, the uh, name is uh, Sakura. This is located to the west side from our university around here. Okay, So we have hyper laser also uh, installed uh, inside of this facility. Okay? So name is uh, Hermes. And that I really conduct a variety of research and development and ranging from the large, large scale of hyper laser to the, uh, those related to, uh, related to the variety of laser. And they include optical material, optical device, okay, laser system, application, as a, and then that uh, as a result, there are a lot of that, uh, okay, so uh, uh, sees, useful for the industry application. Okay. And the base of, ba based on these, uh, we op operate at the three uh, forum, giving opportunity for uh, co-creation with uh, the various stakeholders and the company. So one uh, forum is a power laser forum, another one uh, laser fusion forum, and the third one op optoelectronics forum. Okay. Now, okay, so the number of the company is about uh, 174, okay? So consequently, we have now that the whole joint research division, which are totally supported by the company. One is Okamoto Optics Research Division for optical coating, another one is Honda Motor Research Division for optical science application. And the third one is a Samsung Research Division. This is a a Korean company, and uh, fourth one is the uh, okay Tares Research Division. So Tares is a French company. So okay, and uh, okay, so that the uh, international collaboration is also that uh, one of the most important uh, efforts for us to expand the structure of our research at our institute. So now we have a MOU with uh, about uh, okay. Uh, 33 uh, institute in the world and the five uh, coordinated office in uh, uh, office overseas. So one is at the uh, uh, ERA, e, e, okay, oh, sorry. Oh, oh. Okay, one is at the uh, uh, ERA, uh, laser facility in Romania. And the other one is at the uh, uh, office in Lawrence Livermore in the United States. Another one is at the uh, office in uh, Ecole Polytechnique, Ruri facility. And one is at uh, uh, okay, Germany, uh, Helmholtz. Okay? And the other one is at the uh, IOP in uh, Vietnam. And uh, I hope that uh, one day in the future, we will have a uh, Overseas Corporation Office in Indonesia, I expect. Okay, so that uh, finally I would like to give you a uh, general comment on this international collaboration as a uh, uh, preface to, of today's meeting. So international, oh, sorry, 
international international uh, collaborative partnership are mutually important in achieving our research goal. And we can work together harmoniously and uh, mutually beneficially create new idea uh, for joint research and exchange resources. Our diverse and excellent human resources are for instrumental to successful academic exchange and to the, the production of scientific breakthrough and uh, technological innovation. So we will be able to achieve further result by further strengthening academic cooperation based on the result of our joint research. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kodama, for your uh, speech and introduction to uh, ILE. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration in the future. So uh, I would like to ask uh, all the audience to switch on your video because uh, we are going to take a picture together. So uh, for the proof that we are doing this, we have done this terminal. So please, uh, for the audience, we'll switch on your video for a while and then I will let you know then whether is it ready. So, Pak Wildan, silakan kalau sudah. Oke. Okay. Sudah? Oke. Okay. Yep, terima kasih Bapak Ibu. Thank you very much for the audience. Uh, you can switch off your video again to to make the uh, connection become easier. So I uh, would like to thanks to Dr. Agus Haryono and also Professor Kodama uh, for opening this webinar. So uh, I know that you are kind of uh, very busy. So if you would like to continue your work, uh, you are free to continue your work or you can stay here in the seminar, it's up to you. So thank you very much. So. Uh, for the audience, I have a short uh, information. So there's an attending attendance list for the e-certificate. Please fill the form link in the chat room. And also the question can be written in the chat room. Uh, the information is there. And also there will be a door prize for audience uh, after this uh, seminar. The certificate and the door prize will be delivered next week. Okay. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mohandis Siddiq from LIPI. So, Dr. Mohandis, you can prepare sharing the uh, your presentation. So, I will tell uh, your uh, bio data a little bit. Uh, Dr. Mohandis Siddiq uh, graduated from Florida State University, USA, in 2015 and he did some postdoc in Germany and after that in 2018 joined LIPI and he has published about more than 20 uh, publication and today he will talk about the nanomaterials for energy application. So a uh, 30 minute presentation for Dr. Mohandis Siddiq, uh, the time is yours. Hello, Pak Hans. Dr. Mohandis, can you hear me? Ding. Uh, Dr. Mohandis, you're still mute. Please unmute your microphone. Okay, you can start.
Hello. Can you yeah, hear? you can. Yeah, I can hear now. Okay. okay. I see. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, um, uh, my talk this afternoon is about uh, nanomaterials for en energy applications. So, here, uh, I will talk about uh, mainly uh, our research in uh, laser group in Indonesian Institute of Sciences. So, uh, so uh, the thing that uh, I will talk is not only about uh, my research, but also about uh, uh, other group members' uh, research in uh, laser group. Okay. Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, we need to define what is uh, uh, nanomaterials here. So here, you can see uh, this, uh, the scale of things uh, in everyday uh, uh, objects here. Here uh, we have uh, like mic uh, microprocessor, it's in the uh, range of uh, millimeters and the transistor, uh, silicon uh, on uh, insulator transistor, which is uh, around um, micrometers. Uh, you have uh, this uh, bacteria. So uh, uh, like uh, everyday objects uh, uh, have many uh, different uh, range of uh, size. So here with the nanomaterials, we focus on the uh, here, 10 to the nine uh, uh, meter size, which is uh, the size of this uh, quantum dots and uh, organic uh, molecule, and maybe the NA also, the NA. So- uh, Dr. Mohandis, sorry, can you display your uh, PowerPoint, please? Uh, is it, uh, there's is no- it, is, 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 just uh, uh, screenplay, is it possible? Because it's still in the form of PowerPoint. The slide show, Pak. Slide show aja, bisa. In below. Uh, bawah, di bawah, ada kode uh, show slide. Bawah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Share. Now, uh, di bagian bawah slide show kayak mau presentasi aja yang bawah display di PowerPoint. Ya yeah, itu. Oh ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. can continue. Thank you. Sorry buat. Oke. Okay. So uh, in physics, uh, the original definition of nanomaterial is. Uh, about quantum size effects, where the electronics and optical properties of materials uh, alter greatly with uh, reductions in size. However, uh, this uh, uh, definition, this uh, definition is not uh, adequate for uh, like uh, legal purpose or uh, economic purpose. So, uh, uh, European Commission uh, define a new def uh, uh, a new definition, which is uh, a natural or manu manufactured material containing particles in an unborn state or as an aggregate or as an agglomerate and where for 50% or more of the particles in the number size distribution, one or more external dimensions is in the size range one nanometer to 100 nanometers. So the size range is uh, this one, uh, it's uh, below 100 nanometers and uh, above one nanometers. So it's uh, the definition of nanomaterials. So, uh, but still sometimes it's uh, like, uh, you can push it a little bit more into like 500 nanometers, something like that. So uh, 
the interesting thing about nanomaterial is uh, the quantum confinement effect here. Uh, like uh, this is uh, the very bas basic of uh, properties in the material. So the decrease in confining dimensions or the particle size of the material makes the energy level uh, become more discrete and widen up the energy level here. We can have uh, like a uh, uh, macroscopic object. It's uh, like in, in the bulk, bulk solid state body. And then you have this, uh, you can uh, make it smaller, smaller and smaller until in the range of uh, quantum dot. Actually uh, this uh, here, you can have a nanoparticles, which is still a, a continuous uh, uh, energy level. But we will talk about uh, nanoparticle later. So here, from um, bulk uh, materials into quantum dot, which is uh, already uh, have uh, discrete energy levels. And then from quantum dot, you have molecule, which is uh, smaller, and then you have this uh, energy level widen. And then from molecule, you can have atom, which uh, widen the energy gap even more. So uh, this is an example of uh, nanomaterials, which is uh, quantum dots. So here you have a uh, uh, decreasing size from four nanometers into uh, two nanometers. And you can see the, uh, here the absorbance, and this is the photoluminescence. You can see the peak moving into the, uh, into the uh, lower wavelength, which is a uh, higher frequency. That means a uh, higher uh, uh, energy gap because uh, uh, energy gap uh, equals, uh, the energy equals to uh, uh, Planck constants times uh, frequency. So uh, the higher frequency will be the higher energy gap. Okay, uh, so uh, back to uh, our research in uh, Lasser Group in a uh, research center for physics. So we have here uh, the most complete laser system for research in Indonesia. We have uh, various uh, laser systems such as nanosecond pulse laser, picosecond pulse laser, femtosecond pulse laser, and uh, CO2 high power laser. Uh, so the research group of laser is uh, conducting research mainly in synthesis and optical characterization of nanomaterials, uh, which uh, we will talk shortly. So uh, one of the <coughs> nanomaterials that we uh, investigate is uh, carbon-based nanoparticles. So why carbon-based nanoparticles? Uh, it is because uh, uh, carbon-based nanomat uh, nano nanomaterials uh, prove to be uh, stronger materials, but lighter. Uh, and then there is uh, the question of uh, scal uh, scal scalability of production. Uh, it is very cheap to make uh, carbon-based nanomaterials. And then about uh, the uh, environment and sustainability. So it's a uh, uh, most of the carbon-based nanomaterials can be made uh, with uh, uh, eco-friendly uh, fabrication. So uh, also there is a, 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 a utilities in uh, for the for medicine and also uh, for medicine because you know uh, human body is composed mostly of carbon, so when you have this uh, carbon-based nanomaterial, so it's, uh, it's mostly safe for a human body. Uh, and this is uh, like uh, the examples are of carbon-based nanomaterials. Uh, here we have uh, graphene, which is uh, just uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, carbon, a sheet of carbon, and then graphite. And then uh, carbon uh, nanotube, and then uh, fluorine. So uh, 
uh, we focus mainly on carbon dots here, which is uh, the research of uh, Dr. Isnaini. So why uh, why we choose uh, carbon dot? So carbon dot is an emerging subset of nanomaterials. Uh, it is uh, like uh, quantum dots, which is mostly uh, uh, semiconductors, but carbon dot is quantum dot which, which made of uh, carbon, not sem semiconductor. So it's it's more uh, eco-friendly. And then uh, uh, it has a low toxicity and also uh, it is uh, cheaper. And then it has a uh, strong and uh, tunable fluorescence emission properties also. And uh, so uh, the synthesis of carbon dots is really cheap. Uh, it can be made uh, uh, from uh, natural products actually, uh, beside the uh, synthetic product, like uh, uh, like waste of uh, waste of human com consumption, like. Uh, uh, the natural products is like uh, uh, papaya, coconut, ginger, cane sugar, uh, fruit peel, which is uh, the, uh, the waste, and also uh, from uh, flowers, in this case, uh, bougainville. And uh, synthesis process also uh, easy. You can have use microwave assisted, uh, assisted fabrication or a uh, hydrothermal uh, fabrication. So uh, uh, this is an example of uh, carbon uh, dots. So uh, this is uh, the publication that uh, we already produce in uh, our group. So you can have here, uh, you can make uh, uh, carbon dots from bio waste, from rice husk, watermelon peel so it's a uh, it's a uh, the the source is a uh, very uh, diverse the source of uh, fabrication of the carbon dots so uh, so carbon dots uh, uh, displays uh, uh, photoluminescence Uh, and this uh, display photoluminescence, but uh, there is still a dispute from uh, in uh, from what uh, mechanisms that this photoluminescence uh, come from. So uh, uh, one uh, one argues that it is uh, uh, from the emission from the core. And another argue it is uh, emission from surface. So here, when we sign light to the uh, uh, carbon dots, uh, it absorb the light, and it's uh, it, em it emit back the light uh, with uh, so it's it, it can be uh, like uh, direct emission here, or it can be. It's uh, from the core to the surface, and then uh, it, the surface emit it back. So it can be from the core or from the surface. There are two mechanisms. So uh, here in a uh, laser group, we have uh, like we have concrete system for, uh, for uh, measurements of op optical properties of uh, carbon dots. So uh, here uh, we have a uh, picosecond laser to measure the uh, AR properties and also a uh, femtol uh, second laser. So we can do a uh, UV uh, phase absorbance measurement, photoluminescence that uh, 
that uh, we can also use uh, time of uh, photon to photon excitation. Uh, we also have uh, we, uh, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, it's not uh, depicted here, but we have uh, Raman spectroscopy and also uh, Fourier transfer uh, infra infrared uh, uh, spectroscopy. We have time and same. Is uh, more to the equipment center for physics, not uh, exactly for, not exactly in the lesser group. So this is uh, the time of the uh, carbon dots uh, uh, from uh, Ken Sugar, and this is the absorbance. Uh, also carbon dots from can sugar and you can see here uh, this is the concentrations when you have uh, when you change the concentration the absorbance also change also as you can see so here so with the increasing of concentration that's uh, the uh, the absorbance peaks also move to the to the uh, higher side and uh, uh, photoluminescence or PL, uh, or PL it we also saw here the when you have the concentration of carbon dots uh, increasing the peak wavelength the peak of the PL also uh, move to the higher uh, higher side of the uh, wavelength. So uh, from here, uh, I mean, we argue we argue in the in this paper that uh, the the main mechanism of uh, luminescence uh, from uh, carbon dots uh, from cane sugar is uh, from uh, surface uh, surface mechanism, not core mechanism. And uh, this is the two photon excitation for carbon dots from uh, cane sugar. So uh, besides uh, doing a synthesis of carbon dots and uh, doing the characterization, we also do research uh, for the application of carbon dots. So uh, here, uh, the application, you can have uh, uh, the carbon dots as sensors, uh, luminescence flexible uh, films, color uh, uh, LED, and of course uh, uh, the uh, carbon dots or carbon-based nanomaterial can be used in uh, energy application. Here, it's uh, it's in a, we pick uh, an examples for solar cells. It's a uh, in this uh, in this uh, example, it's uh, a type of solar cell called a disensitized solar cells. So here uh, uh, we have uh, here the example is uh, the carbon dots uh, is uh, deposited on the photo anode of uh, disensitized solar cells. And it's, it changed the energy level of the solar cells, of the, uh, the, the anode, the photo anode from, uh, it makes it the source, uh, the uh, energy, energy gap uh, uh, smaller. So it, uh, so it, it promotes a more efficient uh, solar cell. Also, uh, because uh, it is deposited on the on this uh, uh, photo uh, uh, photo anodes, it's uh, it has this uh, diffuse uh, diffuse reflection mechanism that makes the light that uh, uh, that is uh, the light reflected more efficiently. So it it increase the increases the efficiency of the solar cells. Uh, until uh, seven times. And uh, 
here. Uh, actually, this is uh, similar to previous examples. So, so the uh, this is not exactly carbon uh, dots, but uh, it more uh, graphene uh, quantum dots. So this uh, carbon-based nanomaterials makes the uh, alignment of uh, energy level. So here, uh, between uh, the TiO, ZnO, and uh, the iodine uh, uh, in solar cells, uh, the uh, uh, graphene quantum dots uh, makes the energy le level uh, more uh, aligned. So uh, it's so there will be a more efficient transfer of charge here. So this is in metal oxides, and this is in the electron blocking layer. So they, uh, the addition of uh, uh, graphene quantum dots uh, makes the uh, uh, electron blocking layer uh, more efficient blocking the uh, electron here. So it's uh, again the alignment of energy level here. And this is the uh, bulk het uh, heterojunctions uh, in a uh, polymer solar cell. Again, it's uh, the alignment of, uh, of energy level. So uh, the big tech here is uh, for uh, 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 carbon nanodots uh, in solar cell. It's uh, it's more about uh, the alignment of uh, energy level. So it and then so it it will be uh, uh, more uh, efficient in uh, uh, charge transfers. So it uh, increases the efficiency of a uh, solar cell. Uh, so we move to the next uh, examples of our research. It's uh, uh, nanoparticles and nanoclusters. So here uh, again, uh, we have a diagram. Uh, so this, uh, in the very lab, actually, there's a like ball, and then nanoparticles and cluster, and then single atom. So here, the nanoparticle actually still have uh, a continuous uh, energy levels. The energy level began to uh, be, began to become discrete in the cluster. So uh, for uh, nanomath particles, because it is uh, continuous uh, energy level, so we have this uh, phenomenon called uh, localized plasma resonance. So here, if we send uh, an electromagnetic waves, it will disturb the uh, the cloud of electron here, and this cloud of electron will uh, also move uh, periodically, and then it will also absorb the energy of the uh, electric field. So uh, if we have uh, the graph of the absorption, the, uh, there's uh, like a distinct absorption here in a certain wavelength. So uh, usually uh, we deal with, uh, 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 with uh, gold and silver nanoparticles because they have uh, uh, like uh, the absorption peak in the uh, uh, visible uh, range, in the UV visible range. So for the nanoparticles, there are two methods or generally for nanomaterials, there are two methods for uh, synthesizing them. It is top down and bottom up. The top down is usually physical uh, mechanism, physical process. The bottom up usually a uh, chemical process. And uh, in a laser group, we use uh, pulse laser uh, ablation of solid as uh, like physical methods and pulse laser induced uh, photoreduction. This is a uh, chemical reduction methods. So we heavily use these uh, two uh, methods. 
So post uh, laser ablation in liquid, uh, we use uh, usually a femtosecond laser. Uh, it's a uh, uh, ultra fast deposition of photon energy faster than the electron lattice relaxation. So, uh, and this is, uh, it is uh, focused uh, in uh, such a very small area. So the extreme peak power will be uh, more than 10 to the 10 watts. So uh, this is, uh, okay. And for the uh, second method is a pulse laser assisted synthesis of uh, uh, nanoparticles. So there is uh, like a, uh, here in the liquid, there is a, we, uh, we have a metal source, and then we use a femtosecond laser to uh, reduce the metal source into uh, its component, which is a, a nanostructure uh, products. So here, solid target in solvent, we use uh, pulse laser ablation in liquid. For uh, we, if we have metal salt solution, we use pulse laser in this uh, nucleation, which is uh, this one. Dr. Okay. Muhadis, sorry, uh, you have five minutes left. So this is uh, uh, the mechanism of the pulse laser ablation in uh, solid target. And I want to just uh, emphasize here, this <coughs> post laser ablation of solid target is uh, uh, producing uh, like uh, pure, uh, pure nanoparticles without, uh, like, uh, without anything else. So there's no uh, purification required, which is something that always be done in uh, chemical uh, methods. So uh, that is the, uh, the the advantage of a uh, uh, post uh, ablation for uh, synthesizing nanoparticles. Uh, so this is the examples of uh, post laser ablation uh, for uh, silver nanoparticles for a Raman substrate, and this is for uh, zinc oxide uh, silver nanoparticles. Actually, this is. Uh, uh, Yeah, uh, this is uh, the research of uh, my colleague, uh, Nurfina Yudasari. And uh, we have now uh, for a metal nanocluster, metal nanocluster have uh, a discrete uh, energy level. And uh, it consists of small number of atoms, less than three nanometers for the size. <coughs> and for metal nanocluster, uh, we actually uh, just recently synthesized this uh, type of uh, nanomaterials. So it's, uh, it's uh, silver uh, nanoclusters. So we don't really have much experience in this, uh, in this, uh, in this field, in this uh, uh, field of research. So, uh, and then uh, the metal nanocluster can also be used in solar cell applications like uh, in carbon dots as uh, to uh, close the uh, the energy level gap so it makes for the for more efficient charge transfer here uh, about, uh, for uh, electron and uh, hole that uh, that is not easily uh, recombined and this is actually from uh, other researcher uh, research it's, uh, in JAX. So you can see here for the uh, in, uh, nanocluster enhanced uh, solar cell, it's uh, the current density is uh, higher and also the uh, efficiency also higher. Okay, uh, and this is actually our group members of uh, laser group. Uh, Dr. Isan Naini is currently the group leader and we have uh, one, two, uh, six doctor and then uh, the rest is uh, still in the process to become a PhD, still in uh, 
still a PhD student. And uh, the carbon dot research is done by uh, Dr. Isnaini. And then there is uh, 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 Dr. Yulieti Herbani, uh, usually uh, do research on nanoparticles. Also, uh, Nurfina Yudasari. And uh, actually, this is the Laser Research Group. Uh, the position of Laser Research Group in the uh, in Institute of Science. And this is our location, our office in uh, Serpong, Banten. And uh, we have also collaborated with uh, many uh, research groups around the world. And thank you. Hopefully, it's not too long <laughs> for the presentation. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mohandis. You're just right on time. So uh, thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation uh, regarding uh, some nanomaterials that can be used uh, for, uh, for energy devices. Thank you very much. So now I will move on to uh, second speakers. Uh, Dr. Valin Katrin, you can prepare uh, for the sharing the slides while I'm describing uh, while I'm talking about your biodata. Dr. Farin Katrin Magusara uh, graduated from uh, University of Fukui in 2017 in the field of terahertz and terahertz pentronic and optics. And also he did postdoc in University of Fukui uh, three years. And after that, this year, uh, she joined uh, in the ILE Osaka as a specially appointed researcher in the Institute of Laser Engineering, Osaka University. She has published more than 40 publications. And today he, she will talk about a powerful non-destructive evaluation tools, terahertz spectroscopy for material characterization. For Dr. Farid Katrin, the time is yours. 40 minutes, uh, just a reminder. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in to the, me today's webinar. Uh, so right now I'm delivering this talk from the ILE complex. So in the ILE complex, we have building I for the administration, building E where we have the big laser Gecko 12, building L, and then somewhere here on the third floor of the I building is where I'm right now. And then we also have the 21st Century Plaza building where most of the facilities that our group manages uh, is located. So the 21st Century Plaza building is right at the back of this part of the E building. In the ILE website, which is quite informative, you will see that there are four groups and this has already been discussed by Professor Kodama. So among the four groups, there's the Photon Beam Science Research Division. And under this division are several subgroups. In fact, you will see another terahertz group there, but our group belongs to the Ultra Broadband Photonics or the UP. And UP is the Yoshimura Nakajima Lab. So this is our website. We are officially headed by Professor Yoshimura, who is also the head of the Photon Beam Science Division. And I'm directly working under Professor Nakajima. So our group as a whole is very much involved in the development of devices solid state physics research and non-destructive inspection of various materials. And these three major, sub, uh, major topics have a common denominator in terahertz wave, terahertz spectroscopy, terahertz radiation. So this afternoon, I will talk about terahertz radiation and the uses of terahertz spectroscopy in non-destructive uh, material investigation. So there you have the three common phrases. 
So let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum and where terahertz is. So basically the name comes from the, uh, the Greek word for 10 to the 12, which is tera. And then this uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum is flanked by the microwaves in the, and the infrared. In terms of technology, you have on one side, uh, those that are uh, built on radio waves and microwaves, the electronics. And on the other side, you have photonics. So actually that for a long, long time and uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, it's terahertz that was the last to be developed. You already had the X-ray, we already had the gamma rays, we already had the technology for the radio waves and the microwaves, but the, the, tera, the tera wave uh, applications had to wait for more maturity in uh, developing electronics and photonics because uh, in order to tap the resources that are available in this uh, electromagnetic region, we need powerful lasers and ultra fast lasers. So uh, the frequency range of the terahertz region is from 0.1 terahertz or 100 gigahertz to about 10 terahertz, but sometimes the definition can be extended to 30 terahertz. And then this frequency range corresponds to 10 picoseconds on the 0.1 terahertz side and 0.1 picoseconds on the 10 terahertz side. And the wavelength corresponding wavelength range is from 30 microns to three millimeters. So basically when we say one terahertz, we are talking about 300 microns or in photon energy, we are talking about 4.1 MeV. So what's great about this terahertz region is that it actually belongs to the non-ionizing uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum versus say X-rays and the gamma rays and the UV, they are under ionizing. So what we're saying is that among the great properties of the terahertz waves, it is safe for humans and it can actually penetrate non-conducting and non-polar materials such as plastics and paper. And the propagation and manipulation can be very well understood by Maxwell's equations, of course, because it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the, special, uh, the spectral features correspond to a number of fundamental physical processes. So in the next slide, I'll show you what this uh, basic interests in the terrace region that we have. Yep. Do that. Do that. So here, uh, we have a list of various materials and all these materials have low energy excitations that we can probe if we want to with terahertz. So under semiconductor, you have free carrier dynamics. You can study phonons, plasmons, LO phonon plasmon coupled mode, cyclotron resonance, magnetoplasma. And, that, and if you look at all the other uh, materials, you basically have all the uh, interesting excitations that you could possibly study can be uh, accessed if you have terahertz radiation. So how do we produce terahertz radiation in the first place? Uh, so basically, uh, the previous slide also means that if we harness terahertz radiation to study all those things, then we can actually apply the technology to a multidisciplinary uh, to multidisciplinary fields from biology to condensed matter to industrial applications to security and practical everyday things and other things like gases and plasmas, communications, astrophysics, and atmospheric chemistry. So all these applications are hinged on the developments in terahertz science and technology, particularly on spectroscopy and imaging systems. 
and these systems uh, rely on also on our research in the generation, the detection, and the manipulation of terahertz radiation, and as well as ultra-fast lasers. So for the generation, we have terahertz emitters and sources. For detection, we have what the so-called detectors and or receivers. And for manipulation, these are the mirrors, the beam splitters, all the other components of the systems that are not under emitters or detectors. So there are a variety of materials and devices that we can use to generate terahertz radiation by femtosecond laser excitation. And in the list, there are six now. In the list, the most commonly used are the semiconductor photoconductive antennas or the Austin switches and the nonlinear optical effect in dielectrics and semiconductors. So other sources are semiconductor surfaces, uh, uh, recently magnetic heterostructures, and uh, one of the most intense terahertz sources is actually the air plasma. And um, quite recently, water is also being studied as a terahertz radiation source. So let's focus on the two um, most commonly used materials. So under this category, the photoconductive antenna works as a terahertz emitter uh, by the mechanism of photo excited carrier acceleration. This is either by drift or by diffusion of charge carriers. So here, if you have a femtosecond laser pulse that impinges or irradiates the gap in the switch, uh, the material reacts with or responds with the emission of terahertz radiation from that same gap. And then for the other common, the uh, utilized category for uh, terahertz emitters, it's the electro-optic crystals. So here you have lithium niobate, zinc telluride, and gallium phosphide. Uh, this classification of terahertz emitters rely on uh, the optical rectification due to the second order nonlinear effect. So basically, uh, the changes in polarization will uh, affect uh, in the crystal due to the femtosecond laser excitation will result in a terahertz pulse. So basically, the terahertz generation mechanism by femtosecond laser excitation happens in three steps. So first, you have ultrafast excitation courtesy of your ultrafast laser. So in this case, we typically use the femtosecond laser or the pulse laser. And then because uh, you're irradiating the material or the emitter with ultra-fast laser pulses, the material, of course, responds to that by producing a photocurrent. So this photocurrent is a transverse transient charge current. If your excitation is ultra-fast, then you can also expect your, the response to be uh, fast. So in this uh, trans transverse transient charge current actually produces your terahertz radiation. So to represent that in, in a mathematical form, uh, your, the electric field of your, the radiated field from the material is proportional to the photocurrent, which is proportional to the uh, uh, photocurrent density. And this photocurrent density is actually, can be actually expressed uh, in terms of electronic charge, photocarrier density, and the velocity of carrier. So actually, it means that if you can measure your electric field, then you will have uh, also quantitative uh, data on the photocarrier density and the velocity of carriers since the electronic charge is already known. So in this video, I'm showing 
uh, how we measure terahertz radiation by femtosecond laser pulses. So just follow that laser line there. And then I'll explain later what's going on. It looks complicated, but here is where it's important. So here you have a terahertz lace, uh, the terahertz, and then you have the probe pulses going through the sample at different times. So why is this thing here being repeated? I'll show you why. So in this case, the sample here is also the detector of your the detector material of the terahertz so that the probe and the terahertz radiation are both incident on this sample here and the analysis of the data from this uh, interaction here is done through a computer-aided acquisition so let's represent what's happening there with just a simple schematic. So you have a femtosecond laser. You split that femtosecond laser into two beams. And what, the pump pulse goes to the emitter. So here, what happens is terahertz generation. And terahertz generation, of course, you produce your electric field or the terahertz wave. Now, this terahertz wave is uh, collimated and directed, focused onto the detector. So in this case, the detector is here and the probe beam is also incident on the detector. So if you have probe pulses, uh, you can actually tr create a time trace of the terahertz wave because your probe pulses are so much smaller in time scale compared to the time scale of your terahertz wave. So it means that if you have more at, or if you have a train of probe pulses, then you can recreate the signal. So that's what happened in the previous video. Now, what I've just done is to show you the uh, configuration for terahertz time domain spectroscopy. So what is this terahertz time dom domain spectroscopy or terahertz TDS? The key feature of this spectroscopy setup is the coherent generation and detection of pulse terahertz radiation by ultra-fast laser excitation. So you basically have the same source, uh, the same laser source for the pulse and, uh, for the pump and the probe. And then at some point you can insert a sample or your detector can be the sample or your emitter can be the sample either way. So it's very versatile. You can modify this setup in so many different ways and you can do a lot of things with it. But what's more important is that this uh, spectroscopy setup allows sensitive measurements with direct information on the terahertz electric field. That means it's, it has information both on amplitude and phase versus the Fourier transform infrared spectrophotometer, uh, the FTIR only provides the amplitude, not the information on the phase. And then also here, the phase is time resolved. And that means if it's capable of doing this thing for us, then it can be a convenient tool for non-destructive and informative material evaluation. And moreover, it's, it can be non-contact, so you don't have to have uh, extra uh, lithography or addition of electrical contacts to be able to do material investigation. So time, the terahertz TDS was primarily developed by the by Professor Gryskowski of IBM. So the output current signal is proportional to the electric field of the terahertz wave measured at the so in this case, they're using a photoconductive antenna based on low temperature grown gallium arsenide. So the detector, both the detector and the emitter are photoconductive antennas. And here the sample can be placed in between the two parabolic mirrors. So how, how does this help us do the material investigation? Later, I will show you how, but uh, 
So as I've said earlier, you can actually modify the basic terahertz TDS design into your preferred configuration. So there are various types of terahertz TDS systems and the main categories are transmission type, the reflection type, the video was of transmission type, so reflection type, and then the lipsometry type. So actually, ellipsometry and reflection are almost similar, except that the lipsometry is more specific on the polarization, PRS, of the radiation coming from your uh, emitter antenna to test the sample. So this basically tracks changes in the polarization, either PRS and PRS, uh, P and S actually, to, in order to extract uh, material properties of the sample. And then you can also, all of these uh, terror CDS systems can be modified for low temperature measurements by, of course, introducing a cryogenic setup within that system. So here I'm going to show you the waveform and spectrum of terahertz radiation. In this case, the terahertz source is a photoconductive antenna with 50 micron gap. It's a dipole type and the laser pulse width of the excitation pulse is 80 femtoseconds. So here, the full width attack maximum of the time domain waveform of the terahertz radiation is 250 femtoseconds, which is quite just a little bigger than your laser pulse width. So it's 0.25 picoseconds. And when you do the Fourier transform of this uh, time domain waveform, you will see that the radiation is broadband from zero to about five terahertz. So in this case, uh, we normally use a scale of uh, either the, in terms of wave numbers for those who are used to working on FTIR and Raman spectroscopy. But in terahertz, we are also using simply in terahertz scale. So keep in mind that 100 per centimeter is actually equal to three terahertz. Now it's also possible to produce ultra broadband radiation by using the other means to produce terahertz radiation, which is by optical rectification. So in this case, the source is a wedge of zinc telluride. It's just very thin, around 180 microns. And when you irradiate this with 12 femtosecond pulse laser, uh, you can actually get a terahertz radiation that, ha that is very broadband from zero to about 60 terahertz. It's more than that terahertz range. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Nakajima has a patent on this zinc telluride wedge uh, ter terahertz emission uh, configuration. So this is how we extract terahertz mat uh, material. Uh, this is how we extract material properties using the data from terahertz TDS. So we basically measure first a reference uh, electric field, meaning without sample. And we also measure the re electric field when we have the sample. So we measure this in time domain, that's electric field versus time in picoseconds. But we can also do from that data, we can also convert that by, uh, by Fourier transformation to uh, electric field versus frequency. So when we convert from time to frequency, uh, we can, what we can do next is to actually get the ratio between the electric field with sample and the electric field without sample. And that ratio will give us the transmittance and the phase shift. So you have both amplitude and phase information. Now, the equivalent uh, expression for the transmittance is quite complicated. It involves Fresnel uh, coefficients for transmission and reflection. And, but if you work this out, 
and we usually work this out by numerical means, you can actually get the expression for your complex refractive index, which has information on the material uh, refractive index in real, uh, the real component and the imaginary component kappa, which is your ex extinction coefficient. So meaning if you get that one, you can also derive other uh, physical quantities such as the complex dielectric constant by this relation here and the absorption coefficient. So from the transmittance, you get the absorption. They, they are related. What's not absorbed is either transmitted or reflected. But since this equation already has your uh, considerations for transmission and reflection, then what's left is the absorption and the absorption coefficient information can be derived from the expression of the uh, extinction coefficient, which is kappa. So as an example, we have here terahertz spectroscopy of a bulk semiconductor. Uh, here we show that there's a temperature dependence of the terahertz waveform transmitted through a p-doped silicon wafer. It's 400 uh, micron th thick and it's doped. So as the sample gets colder, a reflection, a reflection pulse is actually seen in the 16K regime. No, in, starting at the 50, you can already see it developing. So what happens here is that in the low uh, temperature region, your terahertz wave is more susceptible to internal reflection. And then here, it's uh, at, uh, at around room temperature, close to the room temperature, the terahertz wave just simply passes through. Then this is just the terahertz waveform. How about the other properties? So as I've said, if you have information already on your electric field, you can get information on the index of refraction. And from the index of refraction, you can work out the expression for the complex for conductivity. So there's the TRUDE model to guide us how to do it. Later, we can also get the mobility and other parameters. So here we see that uh, in increasing temperature, you have enhancement of mobility. But if the temperature it goes to the lower sections, then your, frequent, uh, your carriers freeze out and stop moving. That's, this is for the real part and for the imaginary part. So imagine you can also see the imaginary component. Uh, we also have the same thing. So if we use the Drude model to fit this information that we have here, we can also get the data for carrier density and mobility. So that's just from a set of terahertz waveforms. You already got a lot of material parameters. And we were able to get the carrier density and mobility without resorting to uh, spin hall measurements. So this was done without contacts and without magnetic field. And we can also do spectroscopy on epitaxial layers or thin film semiconductors. In this case, the N-dope gallium arsenide is just one micron thick and the P-dope gallium arsenide is just 0.5 micron thick. So this is done by ellipsometry uh, and the data uh, analysis is straightforward. You'll be able to get the carrier density, the scattering time, the mobility and the resistivity. Then we can also uh, evaluate carrier lifetime or the carrier dynamics. Uh, so for example, in this thin film semiconductor, so this method was part of my work as a doctor student in the University of Fukui. So the other method is by optical pump terahertz probe, but this case it's a double optical pump terahertz TDS, another modification of the terahertz TDS. So the first pump, what it does is to trigger uh, the terahertz generation. And the second pump is used 
for carrier injection. So what this does is to actually uh, cause the peak of your terahertz signal to decay due to scattering, and then it recovers. So that means by that time, your, uh, your carriers were already, the injected carriers were already depleted. So that means you can actually measure the carrier lifetime. And we did this by, of course, comparing the results with that of a standard optical pump and probe transient photoreflectance. And we see here that we are not just able to get the carrier lifetime, we're also able to measure the scattering time. So the scattering time is when your uh, carriers do uh, the screening on the surface of the gallium arsenide. So that's one. You can do carrier transport investigations using uh, modifications of terahertz spectroscopy. Then we can also do it using gas samples. So here is an example of the transmission spectrum for methanol gas. Uh, for this, you have to have a gas cell in the setup, but basically it shows that when you get the terahertz time domain waveform and do the Fourier transform, you will see the transmission spectrum of your gas or your sample. And actually, if you do the other transmission uh, analysis for other gases, you will find that molecular gases have their own spectral fingerprint. So in this case, this is the spectral fingerprint for methanol. And so that means that through terahertz spectroscopy, we can do identification of molecular gas species and it's good for environmental monitoring studies. We can also do spectroscopy of biomolecules. You have here the spectra of alanine, which is an amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Then if you, if you have a cluster of alanine, you get peptides, or cluster of amino acids, you get peptides, and then if you get more, then you all actually already have protein. So in this case, what we want to show is that for uh, simple molecules or just the basic, if you just have uh, uh, a single alanine, the characteristic spectra are well defined in terms of peaks. And then as you grow in complexity, the larger uh, biomolecules, such as the lysozyme, which is an enzyme or a protein, which does, uh, which is a catalyst for metabolism, uh, the large biomolecules have monotonic spectra. So they lose those uh, signature peaks in their uh, spectra with increasing frequency. So in this case, we are, so it's not just about solids and gases we, and biomolecules. We can also do inspection of inflammable liquids in plastic bottles. So remember terahertz is uh, transmis uh, transmissible through plastic and water is a great absorber of terahertz waves. It does not really, it's not really a good transmitter. So there's the difference if you go through the airport before this was done, uh, if you go through the airport, they had a microwave pet bottle checker, but now they do it simply by letting you throw away all the liquids that you have before you go through the inspection machine. So in this study, there's just, they just inserted a simple plastic bottle with some liquid inside and like the gases, the inflammable liquids also have their signature uh, spectrum. So benzene can be differentiated from kerosene, from gas oil, and from gasoline. There's also a bridge between terahertz spectroscopy and terahertz imaging. Usually they can be uh, 
done together. So the pioneering work on terahertz imaging was achieved by B.B. Hu and Austin in published in 1995. What they did was to show, was to demonstrate that they can do terahertz imaging of an IC package inside a plastic casing and even a fresh leaf. And then after 48 hours, they compared the terahertz uh, image. So here, the resolution is 250 microns and they did it for 50,000 pixels. So the speed of this uh, breakthrough technology that time was 12 pixels per 12 pixels per second. And I think they quickly grew to 100 pixels per second. Then uh, for the freshly cut leaf, uh, the difference here in the color is actually due to the water content because a freshly cut leaf has more fresh uh, has more water content than an almost dead leaf. So th that's why they were able to show the contrast. And the key trick in terahertz imaging is to always remember the characteristics of your terahertz wave. So the terahertz wave is highly absorbed by liquid water. It is well transmitted through plastic, paper, and even ceramics. It is completely reflected by metals, and it cannot transmit long distance in air because air attenuates your terahertz radiation. Uh, high speed real time terahertz imaging system was originally conceptualized by Professor Xi Zhang, uh, but in the ILE, this was also implemented. So they had this set up and in the next slide, I'll show you the fun that they had just to demonstrate that this is a real time imaging. So watch for that smiley. They drew a smiley and put it inside an envelope. And then they put the envelope in front of their terahertz scanner. So there you go, you see the smiley. So that's real time. That, So we have practical uses for terahertz spectroscopy and imaging, of course. So in this case, uh, they demonstrated that, the illicit, that illicit drugs such as MDMA and methamphetamine, so MDMA is a form of methamphetamine also just like 67% impurity versus methamphetamine, which is more pure, and aspirin as their uh, reference. So here, you can see that each of these uh, uh, material have their own fingerprint in the frequency spectrum. And they were all concealed inside an envelope. They were placed in plastic and then placed inside paper uh, side by side and several contrast uh, through different uh, terahertz frequencies were done to get the image and then they were post-processed and colorized just to show that you can actually differentiate MDMA, aspirin, and methamphetamine even when inside the envelope. And this shows that you can do non-destructive terahertz imaging of illicit drugs using their spectral fingerprints. And in this case, the spatial distributions of the objects inside the envelope were obtained from the multispectral uh, images using the absorption spectra measured using a tunable terahertz wave source. So one of the milestone achievements in the previous decade by the group that uh, was started in ILE is a collaboration with the Osaka Prefectural Police, and this is a detection of plastic bomb in mail. So it's also it's also it was also concealed inside an envelope, and so this plastic bomb, the C4, 
has a main component. It's a trinitro, one of the trinitro compounds, and it's nicknamed RDX. And RDX also has a spectral signature. So to demonstrate that this can be done, a piece of C4 was placed inside an envelope. And what they did was to show that without the sample, you have this data with the envelope, just this. But when you hit the C4, you have a different uh, electric field response. And so see here that terahertz imaging shows, clearly shows that the uh, C4 is distinct from the envelope and the area around it. So that means your plastic bomb cannot be, uh, what's this? You cannot just send this illegal material through the mail because if the technology is there to detect them without opening the mail, then you get caught. And so far, also for bio applications, we can do terrorist imaging of cancer tissues. So in this case, terrorist absorption was utilized. Uh, uh, liver cancer was embedded in paraffin and the transmission image showed the contrast. So in this case, here it's possible to differentiate the, the cancer tissue from the normal tissue because cancer, the cancerous region has higher absorption of the terrorist radiation than the normal tissue. I'm sorry, Dr. Falin, uh, yeah. five minutes more, thank you. Oh, okay. So we can also do cross-sectional uh, photography of medicine tablet. Uh, so in this case, it can differentiate between the coating and the interior of the tablet. So if you want to check if your tablet is not hollow inside, then you can do uh, terrorist imaging. And in the same way, we can also, we, they also demonstrated tomography of a human finger. And it's also possible to do terrorist imaging and spectroscopy of electronics at the same time. So uh, Professor Nakajima's group also developed the terahertz sensor card. So here you're literally uh, imaging your terahertz wave by instead of now this, we use an IR card to, uh, to monitor our laser source, uh, laser light. But in this case, we can use a terahertz card to monitor the terahertz beam. So another field that's uh, receiving much research attention now is the third spintronics. There are two uh, directions. Uh, one is terahertz emission from spintronic heterostructures. So basically it's from spin current to charge current conversion. I will not talk so much more about this, but this is an ongoing um, research field under rapid development. And then also the ultra fast spin control by terahertz pulses. Remember terahertz radiation is an electromagnetic wave. So that means you can actually have, uh, you, can, you can actually take advantage of its influence on other electromagnetic waves and the uh, information carriers, not just charge carriers, but also spin carriers. So here the goal is to uh, control spin by using terahertz pulses. So what the motivation, the current technology relies on physically or on a physical contact of the magnetic head to reverse uh, magnetic poles. But that sets a limit on the speed. So for further high speed operation, you can use terahertz pulse to control the spin in the picosecond region. So you can think one terabyte per second read or write process. So this is the goal, reversal of the magnetization by terahertz pulse. And before that, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can actually detect terahertz radiation by, from spins. So in this case, uh, Professor Nakajima published a paper in circularly polarized terahertz em emission from rotating spins. And that you can control the spins. So in this case, uh, this is a work on orthoferrite and using also double pulse excitation. And they were able to show that the spin precession changed with um, 
terahertz pulses. So a recent development, and it's actually on the ILE website now, is a press release on a new magnetic recording method. So if you check that press release right there, it says there, Associate Professor Makoto Nakajima of the Institute of Laser Injury, Osaka University, and his co-collaborators in Japan developed a new magnetic recording method or millimeter wave magnetic recording. And if you check the, uh, the associated paper to that, it's actually about the realization of the goal of uh, with the reversal of the spin. So there's the magnetic pole flip by millimeter wave. Uh, this is a breakthrough. You can check advanced materials. Uh, the one that uh, was released just this month, it's fairly recent. And actually it's now one of the 2%, uh, top two, it's in the top 2% papers in advanced materials. So you can check this paper out. So the, the future with terrace technology is also in communications because uh, now we are into 5G, but what's next? If you see here, the limit for 5G is around 100 gigahertz. So what's beyond 100 gigahertz? 100 gigahertz is 0.1 terahertz. So after that, you have terahertz. So the development of terrace devices are very important. Uh, our facilities for research involve various experimental setups for spectroscopy, sensing, imaging, and development of devices. We have optical methods. We have, it's not just about terahertz spectroscopy. We have FTIR. We also have uh, laser printers. And then our spectroscopy systems cover a large uh, uh, wave, wavelength range from 350 to six. Uh, 350 nanometers to six millimeters. So visible infrared and terrace regions are covered. We can target a whole range of materials and we can do a lot of uh, research with our existing facilities, but our access to external facilities are also achieved via partnerships and linkages within ILE, Osaka University and other institutions. So in fact, we have a setup inside the E building, which is which houses the biggest laser. So as a summary, the terrace radiation has a wealth of applications in multiple disciplines. Uh, when we manipulate, generate, detect terahertz waves, we can do it in many different ways and utilize it for non-destructive spectroscopy based investigations of different materials. And this technology is very versatile and the developments continue to be promising. So we can talk about spectroscopy, imaging, spintronics, and the future communication standards. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valin Katrin, for the very nice uh, talk. Uh, about terahertz application. So we can know that the application of the terahertz is so many. <laughs> we can check most of the material using terahertz microscopy. So uh, on the chat room and also Facebook Live, we have also a question. So we can continue the uh, uh, with the question and answer and discussion. Uh, just a reminder for the audience, please. Uh, uh, feel free to uh, fill the attendance list for e-certificate. So I have six questions here, uh, three for Mr. Ha Muhammad Muhandis and three for Dr. Valin Katrin. So I start with uh, Dr. Muhandis first. The question from the Ahmad, Mr. Ahmad Sofian Sulaiman. So I would like to ask what is the role of the functionalized group on the surface of carbon dot? Uh, particularly their role in the interaction with light and how we can prove that the optical property of carbon dot originated from the core or functional group. Thank you for the time. Maybe you can answer quick. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, uh, Dr. Mohandes. Okay, uh, the functional... Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. The functional group, it depends on what functional group. I mean, uh, like nanoparticle also can also has, uh, can also have the functional group on its surface. So it depends, I mean, what kind of functional group 
that is on its surface. And then uh, what is the second question? The second question is about uh, how do we know that the, the origin uh, of the it's, property it's, from the core of functionalized group? It's, it's not functional group, it's uh, the state surface or course, uh, 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 the surface state or core state. So, uh, I mean, actually we, we, we did it uh, uh, on a paper. Uh, if uh, the the photoluminescence from the uh, surf from the surface states, uh, it depends on the uh, on the concentrations of the carbon uh, dots. If it is not from uh, surface state, uh, I mean, uh, on, from the core states, it does not depend on the on the concentration. So. I mean, if you want to test if it is from core or from the surface state, uh, do uh, uh, photoluminescence with uh, uh, varying uh, uh, concentration. Okay, uh, Dr. Mahathis, thank you. Uh, I think uh, if you, uh, for Mr. Ham Ahmad Sofian, if you have further question regarding this, we can answer. You can uh, answer, uh, ask the question. Probably uh, we will uh, collect the question and then later on we will discuss uh, offline. So I'll move on to this uh, question from Facebook Live for uh, Dr. Valin Katrin. Uh, it's a Facebook from from Mr. Uh, from Miss. Julia T, if not mistaken. So the question is, for all the material you have investigated, what material that is the most efficient emitter for terahertz wave? Dr. Catherine? Dr. Fallon, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So it depends on what you want. So if you just need intense terahertz radiation, there's the air plasma, but you can also use uh, the lithium niobate or the zinc telluride electro-optic crystals and the photoconductive antenna as terahertz emitter. I see, so there are many uh, material, including the air also can be used for the emitter, right? So I'll move on to the uh, next uh, question for our for Mr. Uh, Dr. Muhandis, it's from uh, Ibu Eni. It, it can be, so it's in, in, in Indonesia, but I will translate. Uh, how about the application of nanomaterial for nanomedicines, such as for therapy uh, and radiotherapy? And also, uh, that's the first one, probably. Uh, Dr. Muhandis, would, would you like to answer that one, please? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, nano uh, particle can be combined with radiotherapy uh, with radiotherapy for uh, treatment of cancer. So you uh, deliver the, uh, the nanoparticles into the site of cancer, and then you uh, uh, you do radiations on that cancer. So it will be more effective because uh, the uh, the nanoparticles will absorb uh, the uh, the radiation, and then uh, it will uh, heat the, the the cancer or the tumor, and then it is more efficient for the treatment. Usually, it's a gold nanoparticle. Okay, uh, there's another question from uh, Miss Annie. Also, uh, how about the can we use the carbon dot to measure the photosynthetic and energy from microorganism process, such as uh, green non-sulfur or purple non-sulfur bacteria or something like that? Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, I never heard of uh, the carbon dots for uh, 
measuring uh, photosynthetic rate, but I know that uh, uh, some research shows that carbon uh, dots uh, can enhance the, the rates of the uh, pho uh, photosynthesis. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that it can, it can be used for measuring the rate, but uh, and I, I haven't heard about the research yet. So maybe it's, it's an opportunity for uh, for us to to use the carbon as uh, to measure the photo, uh, photosynthesis rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, for Miss Annie, if you have further question, you can ask, and we can discuss offline later on. So uh, I move on to the next question. This is for uh, Dr. Valin Catherine. It's from Mr. Andy Suhandi in the chat room. How is the setup for the low temperature uh, terahertz, actually? Uh, so, okay. Uh, for, so basically, you only have to have the low temperature for the sample. So the, you put the sample inside a cryogenic chamber and you act uh, the, the, what's this? The laser pulses and the terrestrialization will go through quartz windows. So that's basically it. You insert a cryogenic tube into the setup. Somewhere there, you make space for the cryogenic tube that will house your uh, cryogenic chamber that will house your sample. And this sample is still accessible by your uh, pump laser light. And the terahertz radiation can also be uh, transmitted from, uh, from inside the chamber to outside the chamber and it can be detected by your detector. Okay, so, so basically it. It, uh, it's just uh, insert uh, the, the cryostate in, in the middle of the terahertz. So, but we have to modify this, the system so the cryostate and the sample fit to the terahertz yes. system, right? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Katri. So I move on to the next question uh, for Dr. Mohandis. This time from Dr. Mr. Indra Karnadi. Uh, there are two questions. So first is what is the luminescent lifetime for carbon dot? And then the second one, how can you control the size and shape of the carbon dot, I think, yeah, uh, with the laser pass assistant uh, method or something like that? So please. The luminescent lifetime. Uh, let me see. Mm. Uh, wait. <laughs> uh. Uh. Dr. Mohandis, and it's yours. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, you can uh, answer. Uh, we can discuss this one later if you want. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what, what is the question again? What, what is the lifetime of the carbon dot, the luminescent lifetime? And then, can we control the size and the shape of the nanoparticle? Okay, I uh, I will answer the second question first. Uh, uh, the nanoparticle fabricated uh, using laser, uh, 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 Actually, uh, for the size, yes, uh, you can uh, control it by. Uh, by the power and the, uh, how long you uh, illuminated the, uh, the, the, the materials. 
and but uh, about the shape, it, it's usually you, you need to use uh, chemicals, and it's it's somehow uh, uh, it is somehow uh, defeat the 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 purpose of uh, using laser post ablation in liquid that you want to use it uh, for uh, uh, like in the quotation it's uh, pure pure non particle without chemicals so yeah and that's uh, the answer and uh, room thing for the it's uh, in the order of uh, 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 I need to search for it first for the lifetime. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mohandis. We can discuss offline later. Uh, next, I'll move on to a question for uh, Dr. Valin. This time from uh, Mr. Ahmad Sofian again. Uh, how we can interpret the relation between the imaging result and the spectral result in the terahertz microscopy? Okay, Please. so the imaging. The, the image is actually still based on mostly on the spectroscopy. So if you do that, uh, it's usually based on the intensity or how strong your terahertz radiation is from your sample. So or the one that's being imaged. So on different parts of the material, you have different uh, terahertz radiation responses depending on, say, if it's a metal, it will highly reflect. If it has water content, it's a great absorber. So you can you have uh, the ability to differentiate between different parts of the material based on the uh, this this the part by part uh, uh, measurements that you will do on the sample. So you actually have to move the sample. Uh, and so if you do that, so, and then you also, so for example, with the, with the imaging of the, the illicit drugs, they did, uh, they chose a particular frequency. And then for that frequency, your sample has different response. Each of the samples had different response. And then at each frequency, they get these different responses. So one sample is actually stronger in a particular frequency. So let me show that slide. I, I want to here. So if you notice here on this wavelength, it's the methamphetamine that's on the 1.2 frequency range is the methamphetamine that has a peak. Then at the 1.4, it's the aspirin. And the, the MDMA has a higher, it also has a peak at that position, but it's definitely higher than that of the aspirin. So basically you can, based on this one, so if you assign a specific contrast based on the spec the the spectra then when you translate that to the image you can differentiate which one belongs to the mdma which one belongs to the methamphetamine which one belongs to the aspirin so that's why it had to this this in this case it had to be done multispectral because they had to do the measurement several times at different uh, terahertz frequency so, so yeah. the shortcut Thank is you. based on intensities at different frequencies. I see. Uh, thank you. Uh, and for Mr. Ahmad Sofian, if you have further questions, you can ask. We can uh, discuss offline later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember uh, what's the last time. It's uh, in the order of nanoseconds. Sorry. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohandis. The, the, the last question is the, the lifetime of the uh, carbon dot is about 10 seconds. Thank you. So I'll move on to the last question. Uh, I think the time is already uh, almost finished. So the last question for Dr. Valin, Katrin. Uh, this is from Mr. From Mr. Indra. Uh, 
uh, this is actually a good question. Uh, can terahertz spectroscopy be used to study the property of nanomaterials? Yes. <laughs> That's the direct answer, yes. So, direct answer. So, so actually, uh, yeah, uh, is there, there any specific uh, way to do uh, terahertz spectroscopy for nanomaterials? Or so is it the same actually, with the block? No, no, there, there are actually a lot of works already on nanomaterials. In fact, uh, terahertz spectroscopy was already done on quantum dots, uh, indium arsenide based quantum dots. There, there are a number of studies. And then also, even in the terahertz from carbon nanotubes, although the carbon nanotube itself is not a nano, it's not in terms of, it's not very small, but still uh, the structure. <laughs> It's in the nano range. Okay, so yeah, so the property is the same with the bulb. I mean, we can just still uh, observe the property that we usually uh, uh, observe in the bulb, but also the same property can be used. Uh, we can we can observe on, on the nano materials. Yes, is that right? Yes. Okay, that's uh, very nice. So uh, uh, I would like to apologize because. We already finished our two-hour web seminar, so uh, I would like to thanks to uh, Dr. Mohandi Siddiq and Dr. Valin Katrin for your time and presentation and the answer. Uh, it will very helpful and very good information for us. Uh, thank you very much for your time. So uh, for the audience, uh, because we uh, already almost finished, so I like to give a quick announcement. So uh, the certificate and the door prize will be given next week. So just wait for it. Uh, if you have further question about the terahertz spectroscopy and nanomaterial, you can uh, ask uh, the organizer uh, by email and hopefully the two speaker will, will like to answer your question uh, uh, on offline, maybe by email or also if it is it possible. And then, uh, and then what else I would like to say? Okay, and then the, uh, for today, we have a door prize. Uh, there's a phone credit uh, for three people and the, uh, the door prize goes to Mr. Ahmad Sofyan, Mr. Ida Kanati, and Mrs. S. Annie Lestari. So, so uh, the organizer will contact you by email or by uh, WhatsApp. For, uh, for the further information. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the audience uh, who has attended the, this web uh, seminar. And once again, thank you very much for uh, uh, Deputy of Engineering Science, Lippi, and also uh, Director of ILE, Dr. Uh, Professor Kodama, and also for our two speakers, Dr. Mohandi Siddiq and Dr. Falin Katrin, for the valuable uh, information in this seminar. So I would like to close uh, this uh, seminar. Thank you very much, everyone. And stay safe from the COVID-19. And also have a nice uh, weekend because this is Friday. So I close. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a nice